Hi everyone, my name is uh, Ian Flynn. I'm the Head of Creative Solutions here at Rocket Mill. Um, I've been at Rocket Mill for about seven years now. Uh, started off uh, just as a web designer. Um, I started off before that just doing print um, and I've managed to kind of get to a point now where using the kind of skills I've done with design and uh, web design and uh, lucky enough to manage a team of seven talented people. Um, so that is me. Uh, as you could have seen there and seen by me here is I am actually Ginger um, and I know what you guys are thinking, what sort of Ginger is he? Because I would be thinking the same thing. So what I've done for you, I've done like a little uh, Ginger spectrum. So here it is, so on the far left we've got Soulless Ginger <laughs> <laughs> and then on the far right we've got Smug Ginger and I'm kind of sitting about there just so you know, so you can kind of gauge who I am. Uh, right next to Ed Sheeran over here and uh, Beaker from the Muppets over here, so that is it. Good, so Creative Solutions is kind of an ambiguous term, so I'll just kind of explain what that means with, with, uh, within Rocket Mill. So we um, first and foremost do a lot of creative strategy and facilitation. The thing I'm going to be talking about today is personalization, and I think creative strategy is a huge part of that because uh, we need to make sure it's all anchored into one brand idea and one vision. We do UX and UI, a very big buzzword at the moment, UX, but it's uh, crucial for, for things like app development and so forth. Um, we're still very proud to be graphic designers. Um, the, the old kind of disciplines of typography and hierarchy, uh, etc., still apply to within web design, uh, and we don't want that to change. We do conversion optimization, so a little bit more com commercially led, um, uh, an iterative way of designing, uh, involves a lot of uh, JavaScript uh, and so forth, um, which leads me nicely into the next bit, which is HTML5, CSS and JavaScript. So all of us guys, uh, we can design, but we can also code as well, because we're very passionate about making sure that we can implement the things that we want to design. And lastly, because of like, the rise of 5G, we do a lot of video concepting. Um, because uh, we kind of see it as a new way of designing. Uh, motion is going to be a much more regular thing, um, so we need to be aware of that. So we do a lot of concepting and, and editing as well. So today I'm going to talk to you about personalization. Again, a very hot topic within marketing, ultimately uh, making sure that our creative and our targeting is, is as um, targeted as possible um, and uh, using data to do that. I think within the modern day, we need this, this sort of functionality. We will have very different uh, needs and wants commercially and just within our lives. Uh, so it makes sense to use um, digital to um, hone in on that and to give us nice personal experiences. But I think the question I, I like to kind of ask with this is, um, it's all really well and good having lots of siloed experiences that are kind of tailored to our needs, but uh, what about the big brand ideas like the uh, Cabaret's Gorilla, as we all, I'm sure, <laughs> are aware of? This Girl Can campaign, which uh, obviously is revered within the marketing world, I think um, these are kind of things that we've all bound together um, to, to support and to, to um, you know, to, to follow. Um, could, can you do that sort of thing in a very personalised way of design? Um, so I'm going to explore that uh, as we go forward. So just to be completely clear what I'm going to talk to you about in this talk today, so we kind of separate, um, especially from a media perspective, controlling two things within digital. So um, we target the right people and we show the right creative. Um, they're the kind of two levers that we can pull. Um, uh, the media guys will, ve will very much be talking about targeting, um, but for me today, because I'm uh, part of Creative Solutions, we're going to talk about how we show the right creative uh, at the right points to the right people. It covers all digital touch points. So it's not just advertising, it's um, all parts of the funnel, so all the way from, um, yeah, from advertising to, to app design and so forth, so it covers everything. So I'm going to start off by kind of talking to you about the current ways to personalise digital creative and kind of give you some uh, parallels from traditional media as well. And I'm going to put it into the following construct. So um, this is very simplified, attract, convert, retain. Uh, there's kind of lots of grey areas within the middle of that, but it's a good way for us marketers to kind of um, hone in our thoughts and kind of uh, show how creative can differ uh, each part of the marketing funnel. So I'll start with attract. So personalization in a tract, as I say, is not a new thing. We've been doing it for years, so I think we've all been familiar with uh, direct mail campaigns such as this, where uh, they use uh, your, you know, the data they have on you, such as your name <laughs> and address, uh, to make it as personalized as possible. So the concept isn't new. Um, I think it's just been souped up a little bit for the digital spectrum. So this is an example of it with, uh, with Renault. Um, so they've used actually vehicle recognition to personalize it based on you know, the car coming into Westfield here. And it says, hello, new silver hatchback. Um, I aspire something stylish to begin with, which is quite a clever way of attracting someone's attention. Um, and there's not just vehicle recognition 
recognition, which is um, a way of doing this. Apparently, the Xbox One um, has like emotional recognition, um, so you can actually target people based on on that as well, how people are feeling, which is kind of freaky in a, in a weird way. Um, but uh, so this is really cool, and I'm sure we'll be seeing much more of this as as the data progresses uh, and technology progresses. Um, but unless you're Mr. Mayweather here, who has lots of money just to blow on budgets, I think it's probably not the top of your priority list when it comes to your marketing strategy. Um, but there is ways of doing it a lot more affordable. So uh, I'm going to introduce you, which I'm sure a lot of people already know, is something called Dynamic Creative. Uh, and I'm going to let uh, DoubleClick, who um, are our Google partners, to explain more. DoubleClick Rich Media Dynamic Creative lets you set up campaigns with flexible content that you can change any time without ever having to re-traffic creatives. Use Dynamic Creative to optimize your campaign, retarget engaged audiences, and fine-tune messages on the fly. Dynamic Creative makes it easy to target by audience, publishers, time of day, season, location, and more. So I guess the summary of this is um, it, it's using technology to um, give you different ads on the fly based on certain um, data that, um, that, you know, that, that is available uh, for us to use. So um, with DoubleClick, we have something called geotargeting. So uh, you can put uh, different ads based on where someone is based. So it's quite good for language and translation, etc. You can do it based on the website the ad appears on, so contextual. Um, if if a, an ad uh, appears on a bike website, you can make sure that that, that, that message is, is tailored to kind of that audience. Uh, audience targeting in itself, so DMPs such as Choosel, we can have almost buy audiences based on demographics or, or likes or interests and making sure that our creative um, is changed because of that. And scheduled updates, so maybe time of year or season, uh, etc. Uh, we also um, we, we, we use a, a partner called Flash Talking as well, who um, give us a lot more than just these four um, and can go into a lot of granularity. So it's super powerful stuff. To give you an idea how it works, just broadly speaking, um, it's a feed. Uh, so this is a one for geo-targeting, so we've got obviously the different locations there in the uh, blue column. Uh, and then you can see how the creative change is based on those locations, so headlines, call to actions, etc. Then all of that stuff from a feed again gets dynamically populated within HTML5 uh, through headlines and, and images and so forth. Um, and it means that you can create one template and it just basically edits based on those variables that we've set. So, from that as well, there's a, a kind of um, discipline which is kind of coming out of the ether called dynamic creative optimization or DCO, which is kind of the automatic um, optimization of your dynamic ads based on how they're performing. Um, so again, really super powerful stuff. Uh, there's a couple of apps out there that do it, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if this becomes uh, more of a, a regular uh, discussion in the next um, you know, two to five years or whatever. So the technology is powerful, but I like to kind of look at it from the other point of view as well. So um, it can't be too good to be true. So what's the kind of watch outs we have here? How many of you have heard of Gestalt theory before? Yeah? Hey. Oh, loads of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. So the people that don't know what Gestalt theory is, um, ultimately a philosophical theory, I think, which is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So I've explained this in previous forefronts before. And the best way I can describe it is if you think about a recipe like um, carbonara or something is, a, is one thing. Uh, and then the ingredients within that are like eggs, um, you know, cheese, ham, whatever. Put those together and it becomes a carbonara. So it's the individual things become something new. So that's the kind of the, the, the best way I can describe it. So this applies to a lot of things, as I say, like, like recipes, um, but it applies to layouts as well and, and graphic design. So first thing I'll show you here is an abstract symbol. We don't quite know what it is. It looks like a, you know, a little squiggle with a plant at the top. Then it says plants make us happy. So I get a little bit more context now. I can see that they're kind of silhouettes kissing. Then it says they make us want to smooch neck and kiss. They also make our bottles. So now I, I can see the reasoning behind this poster. There's actually a, a something that I need to know about. Then I've got a tiny little logo down there, which probably doesn't mean much. Uh, and then I've got Coca-Cola. So now I know the brand. Uh, and, and actually now it all starts to make sense and it's quite a clever advert. But one of those things on its own uh, doesn't really mean anything. But once they're put together, it becomes um, a bigger thing. So that's just out in action. I guess the point I'm trying to make with this in regards to dynamic creative is it's very easy to create a dog's dinner. So if you've got lots of different things like images and texts and so forth, and they don't necessarily work together, then it's, it's not really going to work. Um, so 
this is why I, I really endorse the, the idea of a creative strategy. You need to make sure that all of your iterations within Dynamic Creative work together and they're all bound into something bigger than just personalization or Dynamic Creative. So that's a track. So going into Convert now. So um, again, given some comparisons to maybe things beyond digital or outside of digital, a lot of people will know this campaign, Coca-Cola personalizing their, their bottles. So obviously this is much more in the convert side of things because you're about to convert where you've got Pepsi and Coke and whatever. Um, this is the, the, the personalization in order to help you try and convert more. So um, again, not, not nothing new and I'm sure it, it really worked as well for, for Coke. Um, so the best way that I can kind of draw a parallel with that with digital is our uh, conversion rate optimization uh, offering within Rocket Mill and digital marketing generally. It's the ability for us to test our websites to make sure that we are converting as best as we can. Um, there's lots of tools that we can do this. So we've got Visual Website Optimizer, which is kind of A-B testing. Google Optimizer is the same thing, and uh, as does Optimizely. They all have different functionalities here or there, but uh, no, part of parcel there, they are um, CRO platforms. So personalization platforms are kind of the step up from that. So um, there's things called Dynamic Yield and Optimize LX. Take it a step further. So it's not just a standard A-B test. Um, it's kind of A-B test to different segments and different audiences. Uh, and I'm going to let um, Optimize LX, who kind of have a nice uh, walkthrough of personalization and, and kind of show you how this works. So you can see on um, Optimize LX here, you click on a scarf and you go back to the home page. Uh, and it says your favorite scarf. So it's a perfect example of kind of personalization on the fly based on your behavior on site, which is really kind of cool and powerful. I spoke to Reese, our head of data, about this, and he kind of words in a slightly different way, which I quite like. I also like this image because it just looks really tasty. <laughs> just by the by. Um, it's hyper segmentation. So it, it's nothing nothing special, it's just segmenting people into different uh, audience gaps and refining it and refining it as much as possible. Um, so the, part the, the benefits of using personalization platforms such as Dynamic Yield, uh, you can learn about the user as they browse. Uh, you can prioritize information based on behavior, um, which again was what I, which I showed you there with the scarf. There's some of the platforms have the ability to algorithmically update experiments in real time. So a bit like the dynamic creative optimization I mentioned earlier, um, they have algorithms which will just get, show segments the things that work better uh, and kind of weight it automatically, which again is super powerful. Uh, and the idea with this, hopefully, is to improve uh, your product's user experience faster. The reason why people convert more is because it's easier for them to do it, or they've been given the right information at the right time. Uh, so by doing this, you can do it very quickly on the fly. But looking at the flip side of it again is uh, success still relies on an accurate hypothesis. So this is part of the, you've got all the machine learning stuff that I spoke to you about here, but you still need a human to kind of create the experiment and to understand, all right, if we do this, it will have this effect. So it still needs an accurate hypothesis. Uh, and by doing that, you need to make sure you do the right research and get the right context within the data that you have. So the kind of analogy I'll, I'll give here is if going back to the scarf um, uh, example earlier, uh, I, I, you know, a sound hypothesis might be that you um, say that people that look for a scarf might want gloves. Um, so you then show them gloves at a certain part of the journey. Uh, but if the scarf, for example, was bought because it, it looked very similar to a Harry Potter scarf and people were buying it as a souvenir, then gloves really don't apply to that at all. And you're showing them something that kind of actually doesn't mean anything to that user. So you really have to do some digging and make sure that your hypothesis is as accurate as possible. Otherwise, you're using that that platform um, actually maybe to have a negative effect on their experience rather than a positive one. And something that I really like to kind of put across is actually you might not need some super fancy expensive platforms to do this stuff for you. Good user experience is now coming to a point where they'll happily personalize for you. So you don't necessarily have to try and guess what they want. They'll just tell you what they want and you just give them the right thing at the right time. So actually for 74% of customers um, feel frustrated when a website content is not personalized. So customers want it. Customers want to be able to personalize the content based on what they want. Um, so, um, so let them do it. And, and if you give them a user experience that allows them to do it, then both parties win. So this is an example from Bulb. Um, first part of personalization here is to put the postcode in, nothing new. Um, I then get shown um, a lovely form. And I'm personalizing on the fly here. I'm saying it's a house, I've got three bedrooms, um, and all of a sudden I've got a personalized quote of how much it's going to cost me. Um, I can then further personalize it uh, to see what my current uh, gas and electricity supplies are. Um, and 
to some really nice things like my insulation is amazing, average, not great. I cook occasionally. So there's things I don't have to necessarily get a whole bill out and do, but it still allows me to personalize um, in a more refined way. Uh, and again, actually, the, the, I think the, the cost has gone up. So again, that actually provides me a little bit of, okay, they're being honest, they're being transparent here. But for me, um, just so people don't know what Bulb is, it's a, it's an, it's a green energy supplier. Um, so for me, it was really interesting to do this because all the questions that I had, it was answering it for me without necessarily having to talk to anyone or whatever. Um, and this is an example of personalization on the fly. So um, yeah, you could save yourself a lot of time and money possibly by doing it this way rather than using fancy, uh, fancy platforms. So lastly, um, retain. So with retention, for me, it's all about making sure that your product, you have an affiliation with the product that you're buying. Uh, so this is a perfect example with uh, the Mitchell and Webb. Um, I'm a PC and I'm a Mac, really obviously well-known campaign in the UK. But it's a perfect example of people identifying themselves with a the product and actually kind of grasping it as part of their identity. This is nothing new and probably more modern examples include uh, Apple, Google, Spotify and Amazon Music for maybe music apps. Lots of people will choose their preference based on their loyalty towards that company uh, and even more specifically the loyalty to the user experience within that app. If that app is really clunky to use, you probably go somewhere else and you're more, you know, you may actually pay more money as a result of it. I personally am a, a Spotify user and it's because I like the experience, I like the functionality that's involved. The same applies to banking apps and actually it's probably more crucial for a lot of banking apps because they, they're going through a massive transformation in the financial industry where it's not necessarily um, customer facing as much as it was, it's, it's much more digital only propositions. So you don't necessarily want to talk to an accountant anymore, you want to just be able to do your stuff yourself as easily and quickly as possible. So things like apps are a perfect way of doing that. And they've had to really up their game, uh, the companies, because it's such a crucial part of their new business. 52% of users said that bad mobile experience made them less likely to engage with the company. So it shows you that it is it's, it's serious stuff here. And if they, you know, for a minute think that it's clunky and they're not providing the functionality that they want, they're just going to go somewhere else. Um, and that's why uh, user experience is such a crucial part of retention. Good thing about um, user experience is you already have the person's data because they've converted. Um, so you, you don't necessarily have to go find it, it's there. For me now, it's making sure that your data is um, properly um, like positioned and structured uh, and you have the ability to pull the necessary data at the right times at the right places. Um, often we've got some clients that have loads of data and so much they don't necessarily know what to do with it. Um, so it's making sure um, from the data that you've got, you, you now understand, okay, what benefits do you have to user, uh, user with the, the data that they have? So the way that I kind of tend to do it is to say, well, what value are you having on people's lives? So with apps, um, you know, you, we will see all these apps that, have, that don't necessarily provide value and it's a bit of tack, you download it uh, and you think, what is this? This is just you trying to sell to me and then you probably delete it shortly afterwards. Um, but if you're actually providing value to people's lives, and not necessarily with a screen as such, then that's where the, the kind of retention piece comes in because you're actually being very uh, empathetic towards their day to day. So a perfect example of this is actually mentioned by Alex, who's in our team. The train line app is really, really good. So basically why it's so good is they, they really consider these kind of um, uh, like parts of people's days. So her example is she bought a ticket to the train line to Three Bridges and five minutes before it went, it says your Three Bridges train departs from platform six in five minutes. Uh, and it tells the, the collection reference. So before she's even looked at the sign above, she already knows it. So you're actually providing information to her before she even realized she needed it. Shortly after that then, it says your train to Brighton is delayed, now it's leaving at 1837. Again, you might not have even been told that um, within the boards or whatever, or you may have missed it. You might have gone to the platform and you think, where is it? Um, so that information is so, so crucial uh, and provides value to people and it's using the notifications functionality in the right way rather than selling them stuff and telling people to sign up and whatever. So a perfect example of using data in the right time at the right place. I realise that I talk quite fast, so it's just me having, having a bit of a pause. <laughs> So I guess the end point I want to make with all of this is uh, with personalization and, and all parts of the funnel is for me get, getting creative right for every touch point is absolutely the essence for a successful marketing strategy. So I'm going to show you how we kind of tend to, to structure it and hopefully it will be a takeaway for you guys. So 
Uh, for me, it always starts with two things. It starts with company vision and it starts with audience data. So the company vision is obviously, where do you guys want to go? What is the purpose of the business? Uh, wh where is it going to be in 10 years or even five years or even two years? Like, uh, why do you do what you do? And it's such an important question. Audience data is making sure you know what the market wants. So if you're, if you're thinking about a company vision and wh where you want to get there, you want to make sure that the people that you're selling to um, it, are, are going to be wanting what you want. Um, so that, that is part of this kind of this blend here is making sure that your company is going in the right direction uh, and the audience are receptive to what you're trying to offer. From that then comes the exciting bit for me, which is the brand idea. So that brand idea is a, a creative expression of, um, of where your company is going and, yeah, and, and what, what, what you're offering to the audience and making sure that that is accurate. Then you go to your con a track convert retain. And examples of those things for, from a creative perspective are advertising, uh, conversion rate optimization, and, and your digital product, so like your app or whatever, which we've been through. Then comes the personalization, so the dynamic creative personalization, data led UX, and then becomes an iteration part there. So I think the point I'm trying to make with this is a lot of people get caught in the personalization, dynamic creative, data led UX as solutions and forget all the bit above it, uh, which is probably the most crucial thing. The creative strategy should always tie into the brand idea and all your messaging throughout, attract all the way down to retain, should have that focus in mind, should understand where your company's going, understand what audience want from it. Um, that should then give you uh, a stead to then start thinking about changing the nuances with dynamic creative personalization uh, and testing and, and going from there. Um, and then that will have a life cycle and then you might want to adjust the brand idea based on the market and that's kind of how it goes. So an example of a brand idea, going back to Bulb again, they actually use their brand idea as part of the attract side of things. So uh, making energy simpler, cheaper and greener. Very, very simple. But it's a brand idea that um, people want. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the audience wanted cheap um, energy uh, and the company vision is to provide that. So it blends really nicely and they've used it as part of their, their you know, attract campaign. Simple as that. From that, I think it's really important to consider um, the kind of human psychology side of things. So there's a couple of books that I love and I've, I've mentioned a few times before. Uh, Seth Godin, Tribes and Sapiens, which talks more about the human makeup of how we, we act together as a species. Um, both of them kind of have parallels and those parallels are that um, we like to follow things. We like to follow ideas. Um, we like to believe in myths that we bind towards. Uh, and that is human nature and that's not going to change. Um, that's what brands are ultimately, is things like Rocket Meal and Google. We follow them because we believe in what they do. Um, and that is really the most, for me, the most effective way of marketing is making sure that you, you do, um, you know, you, you know the ideas that people believe in and you believe in it yourself. Your main purpose as a marketer is to spread ideas that people believe in. Personalization is not the end goal. Spreading your idea is Personalization is just a tactic in achieving it. And that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you.